Hello, everybody. On behalf of College Prep University, I would like to welcome you to our webinar, College Essays Preview. Don't write anything until you've done these three things. My name is Dr. Corgi. I'm here along with Dr. K and George Maylot. And we have quite a lot of uh, information we want to pass along to you today um, about getting ready to write your college essays. And that's the key part, getting ready. Okay, so let me, oh, before I go into the uh, agenda, a couple of housekeeping items. First off is we will be following up uh, with you by sending out an email with uh, all of the um, resources that we talk about during our presentation. So you don't have to worry about writing things down. We will send that out to you. Also, we will be doing a Q&A session at the end. Um, so if you have questions for us as we are talking, um, go ahead and throw those in the chat box in the bottom corner of your screen. And after we get through the formal part of our presentation, we will go to your questions. So to get to the agenda. All right, so tonight we're gonna talk about our stop, wait, and go method, all right? We have uh, some really good pointers that are gonna help you prepare to write your essays. So the very first thing that you need to do in order to get ready to, uh, sorry, to, uh, write your essays is to stop, all right? Just stop. Pencils down, time's up, stop writing, okay? A lot of students wanna just jump in to the essays for their college applications. And in fact, a lot of uh, teachers and well-meaning counselors and other people are very encouraging uh, to 11th grade students at this time of year. Say, oh yeah, go ahead and get a start, start writing your essays, get a head start. It all sounds great. And it is great, all right? But before you write anything, you need to stop, all right, and think. Think about what, this is what we're gonna talk about. Okay, so the first thing you need to do is understand that you are writing with a purpose, all right, a very direct purpose. The writing that you do for your college applications um, should be very different from the traditional writing you've been learning in your English classes, okay? You are trying to accomplish a goal, all right? You do want to have a well-written essay, all right? My little graphic on the side, you'll see all these uh, companies that offer, you know, how to write the best 300-word essay or 10 steps to the perfect essay. And all of those items and all that guidance is great and very appropriate, but not at the beginning of your planning process, all right? You need to utilize those resources later. What we're talking about right now is figuring out what is your purpose, okay? What are you needing to write about? In other words, what topic, right? Now, a lot of um, applications are going to give you a prompt to answer, which, which is fine, but there's a lot behind that prompt, all right? And what you wanna do is really think about what you're going to write about, what is your content going to be before you start writing? Because again, you can have an A plus essay and a lot of students submit the actual essays that they've written in their college, or sorry, their high school English classes where they got an A, all right, from their teacher and the writing can be perfect. It can be great. It can be just like, wow, you should publish this type of writing. But with the college application in mind, this writing is serving a purpose, all right? College admissions um, officers are reading your essays, all right, um, with certain things in mind. And if they don't get that from your essay, it's really uh, what we call um, a missed opportunity, right? I've worked in admissions for a couple of decades, few decades. Um, I've read tens of thousands of college essays. I'm not kidding you, a lot. and just probably a good solid 90% of the essays that I've read through the evaluation and admissions process really were just not helpful. They, they were great writing, nothing, nothing at all wrong with the writing, but as an admissions officer, I didn't get anything from the essay that I could use to build the case, all right, for the student that was leaning towards a yes on admission, right? We refer to that as a missed opportunity, all right? Um, a lot of students think that if they just write the best well-written essay ever, you know, that's going to trump everything else on their application. And yes, you hear stories like that, but it's very much the exception and not the rule, right? The other thing to consider is that not every essay is an actual essay. Um, 
This is very confusing for students because we use this term essay very loosely in this context. If you're given a 300 word count or sometimes even a 500 word count, that, that's not enough space to really develop a full traditional essay. If you have to answer something in 200 words, 250 words, you're not writing an essay, all right? You don't have room for the traditional structure of an essay. So try to get that phrase, even though we use that word, oh, your college essays, your application essays, um, not every essay is an essay. Okay, so you're writing with a purpose. You want to, all right, stop <laughs> and think. And what do you need to think about? Okay, first off is your academic profile. And you might be thinking, well, what in the world right, do my numbers have to do with my essay? That's a completely separate topic, right? Essays are, you know, they're about grammar and spelling and syntax and, you know, impressive vocabulary. And yes, that is true. But again, we're going to push that back for now. And that's something you want to think about really towards the end of the process. All right. You need to get your content down, your topics down, your structure, your outline. And then you go in for the, the quality, all right, of the writing. Um, you know, fancy it up a bit. So why do you need to look at your academic profile? Well, you want to look at your numbers. You need to understand what all of this is saying to you, all right, in a quantitative form. So you want to gather everything and look at everything together. Look at your um, classes that you've taken. Calculate out your college admission GPAs. S, you know, plural, GPAs, multiple. It's another webinar where we are having later that we will teach you how to calculate your multiple college admissions GPAs because, yes, you do have more than one. Um, you want to take a look at all of your test scores, all right, your SAT, ACT, APs, whatever you have, and you want to look at what future exams do you have planned? What additional testing are you going to do late in the spring and in the fall semester? So you want to take a look at all these numbers, and then what do you do, all right? You want to think like an admissions officer. You need to look at those numbers and think, okay, if I were reading this, you know, from the college, what questions am I going to have about these numbers, all right? Um, I know this is a different way of thinking about it, but this is what the admissions people do. This, I've done it. Uh, Dr. K has done it. Uh, George has done it. Um, a lot of our counselors on staff have actually read, okay, applications uh, for UC Berkeley, UC San Diego, all right, multiple competitive institutions, and we all approach it the same way. So the first thing you want to do is be realistic with yourself and look at, you know, do your numbers line up with your goals? All right. Do they match your potential colleges? You definitely need to be comparing your numbers to whatever data you can get from the colleges you are applying to. Not to say, oh, oh I don't have my numbers aren't high enough or my numbers are you know, too low or there's no way I'm ever going to get in because it's not just based on your numbers. But if your numbers are in line with the data that's being published, then, you know, you're like, okay, I don't really have much to worry about there. I'm solidly in their academic profile of what they typically admit. So, you know, check that box. You're good to go. But if your numbers don't match, then we have something that we need to address. And it's beyond the essay, okay? Um, but you, you need to know that. And you need to be looking at that now, all right, really early in the process. What do your numbers say about you, all right? Um, you may have perfect numbers, all right? We've had plenty, 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 plenty of students that have had four point whatever GPAs, 4.7, 4.8. Um, they've had perfect SAT scores. They've had, you know, 12 or 15 fives on AP exams. They've got all these really impressive numbers, all right? But what does that really say about you? Okay, does it say that you are really smart? Does it say you know how to work the system? You know, look at your numbers in context, all right? Do a lot of students at your school have similar numbers? You just need to kind of look at it, you know, and just say, okay, what is this saying about me? And within that process, what you are looking for are inconsistencies, okay, or holes in your academic information. Um, so what I'm talking about is, you know, maybe you had one semester that you did either exceedingly well or exceedingly poor. And then you just kind of have this little blip, this little an an anomaly, all right? So second semester, sophomore year, you know, normally you would get 
B's and C's, but then that one semester you got all A's and then you went back to B's and C's. So, so you know, well, what's going on there? Or the opposite, you know, sometimes you have um, really bad semesters. And a lot of students don't want to address anything low on their academic transcript. And this is absolutely something that needs to be addressed. You need to own that, all right? You need to explain, not in great detail sometimes, but again, we want to then, that leads into the next question, you know, are there underlying issues in your numbers that need to be addressed? Um, another example might be, um, you know, you got all A's in all of your AP classes, but then your AP scores are all ones and twos, all right? That doesn't quite match up. So these are questions that admissions officers are asking themselves while they're looking at your numbers, and then they're hoping to get more of an explanation about it through the rest of your application, including your essays or your, uh, your writings. So anyway, that's why you want to take a look at your academic profile. Your numbers are actually quite important to your essays because they can have some impact on what you choose to write about, right? Even if the prompt isn't asking you about your grades, sometimes you need to talk about your grades, all right, within the context of the prompt. So with that, um, I am going to pass along the microphone to our next speaker, who's going to take us into our next steps. Good evening, everybody. My name is Dr. K. I'm actually going to talk about completing the activity section. So the first part is really looking at the grades and sort of going over what Dr. Corgi has already covered. Then from there, as an admission reader, as someone who's understanding your profile within context, I need to be able to understand how you spent your time and what activities you were involved in. As I'm reviewing the activities that a student may have been involved in, I'm able to get a good sense like, okay, this student did speech and debate. So thus it would make sense that they might go into business marketing because they sort of already built out these strategies in order to be able to convince people to move forward with whatever it is that they're trying to sell. So when we think about the activity section of an application, it does provide additional context in terms of very specifically how a student is able to spend their time. Whenever I do this with my students, I always rename the document at the top and I say, how do you spend your time? Because from an admission standpoint, I want to know what extracurriculars you were involved in, what um, activities at school, any clubs, any organizations, any volunteer. Did you take any classes at a community college class? What did you do over the summer? If you had an opportunity to excel, did you take advantage of it? And then if you didn't have an opportunity to excel, sort of providing some context for that. So I see students write all sorts of things where like, okay, well, I wasn't involved in all of these extracurricular activities because I helped my parents run our family owned business. So we want to be able to captivate all of that in terms of the activities because it does inform maybe what you will write about. I was working with a student this last academic cycle and um, his mom had actually had an illness. So what that meant was that he was not involved in any activities after his sophomore year. And we're going over and we're going back and forth and I'm like, hey, I really need to understand how you're spending your time so that when you write your statements, we're able to contextualize that for admissions reader. So when you think about what this looks like and you think about this in the grand scheme of your application, it is a big factor. And we see so many students, they've done the academic side of it, they wrote their personal statements and they sort of like missed the mark on the activity section and that helped fill in the gap for us. I can sort of see like, okay, this student may have had a hard time the second half of their junior year because they didn't do anything. I'm imagining reading a lot of applications coming out of COVID-19, we're gonna see that there may have been a decrease in activities that students were involved in during that time period. So when we have this information and we have the context, you're filling in those blanks so that the admissions readers are not left to guess. Um, I always tell my students, anything that you don't tell an admissions reader explicitly in the application, even if they can kind of take a guess at it, they're not allowed to make up things or infer things that you haven't directly said. So when we think about you doing an activity worksheet or you doing your resume, it's really important that that captures what you've done, even if you don't necessarily think that it's directly related. Um, a number of my students want to go into computer science, but they don't want to report that they play games. And I'm like, you know, if you play video games and you're creating video games, those things matter in terms of learning coding and Java and all of those things as you move forward in your engineering or computer science major. So it matters that you, you play two hours a day 
for different games to be able to identify what errors are happening within the system and to be able to give suggestions in terms of how they can improve things for other people who are interested in that. So when you provide this, it's really important that you think about that because that does inform what you're going to be writing about in your personal statement to some degree. Now I'm going to pass it over to George. All right, awesome. Thank you, Dr. K. You know, one thing that, that I got out of all of that and that I want to urge all of our audience members to kind of think about is that context is absolutely key, right? And this segues perfectly into what I want to bring about, uh, which is choosing your major. So for a lot of our viewers, right, if you have underclassmen and the juniors that are coming up, this is actually a very important piece to the entire puzzle, right? Because as we're talking about what your grades say about you, what your activities say about you, you want to make sure that all of those things align. There's oftentimes as admissions readers where we'll see a student who wants to do, like Dr. K was mentioning, computer science, but they're heavily involved in the arts and vice versa. And so there's like this question mark as admissions readers where we need a little bit more details and we need to do a little bit of digging, but we can't do that unless you all as applicants provide that information for us. So what you want to do is when you're selecting a major, and this is the first step that we start with a lot of our, our students, you need to ask yourself what classes you enjoyed most and what classes you enjoyed the least. Because moving on to college, you're going to not only have to take some general classes, but typically after the, the first and second year, you're really digging deep into the things that you should be passionate about and really interested in, right? So you want as a student to understand what you enjoy doing and what you don't enjoy doing. Additionally, after we kind of itemize that list and identify uh, what you're good at, what you like and what you don't like, you wanna take an assessment to get a general idea of what options uh, you are best matched with. Um, now. An assessment is not an end-all be-all. That's why with CPU, we do multiple um, and we encourage you to do multiple assessments. In fact, it may be worthwhile to do assessments at different times of the day and uh, throughout your timeline um, because your answers may be a little biased depending on your mood, the timing and things like that. So the sooner you can get an assessment in and have a general idea of what your skill set and your interests align with, the, the better. Um, you also want to explore what each college has to offer. Um, this is critical because often we think that, you know, every college will offer those general um, majors like business, um, almost all of the STEMs, a nursing, engineering, right, all of those things. But there's also very specific majors within schools that might be a perfect fit for you that a lot of other students are not looking to, that are maybe not as passionate about. So identifying those really unique programs can help you um, not only set yourself apart, but really uh, position yourself to be admitted and ultimately have a really great career. And the other thing is do not default to the most popular majors. Working with students, the trend has always been, and we foresee it continuing to be the same few majors at the top of everyone's list, which is business, nursing, and engineering. And then within those things, there's like subcategories and concentrations, right? But for the most part, those are the three that are most popular. But when I tell you that schools have literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different majors, some of them are extremely um, similar and familiar, right? However, there are very unique opportunities, and that's that's the thing I really want to drive home. There's unique opportunities, and you don't necessarily have to choose what is most popular or what a lot of other students are doing. The average amount of um, students who change their majors is about three times. And so what we here at CPU want to kind of focus on and ensure we don't necessarily have to do is by putting in the work sooner so that you won't have to go ahead and change your major and things like that. Now, after we go ahead and we get through all of those things, right? We haven't started uh, putting ink to paper. We haven't started writing yet. This is all the pre-work, right? This is almost like an outline. You wanna go ahead and identify the major as a best fit. The ones that are most interesting, 
But the most important thing is you want to identify connections and patterns between what you wrote down in your activities, what you've been doing academically, and your major. So it's almost like a perfect map where you're splitting things up into sections. And um, I like to be very visual, so I encourage my students to highlight and circle and put stars everywhere. And as you're being guided through that, you'll be able to start noticing that things are slowly beginning to align and that things are beginning to make a lot more sense. So you're now able to provide context on yourself in a much better light. Now, that is going to be when you can then begin to put pen to paper, okay? And last but not least, the one thing that I will say, remember I told you all those other majors, the most popular major is to go undeclared. And I will say it is okay to do that during your admission cycle. It is okay to do that when you're a freshman in college, right? Um, however, you, you do want to plan for the other things, but know that it is okay to be undecided during this time. However, it's still very worthwhile for you to go ahead and put your story in context and make sure that you're doing the pre-work to set up for the actual writing. So I'm going to pass this over back to Dr. K. All right, so what you actually saw us talk about is a contextualized review of a student's application. So we start off with the academic profile, we cover the activities and the resume, and then we talk about their major selection. What this does is it gives a reader a full Vanic view of what they could expect to be reading about when they're actually going in and reading their personal statements. So if I'm looking at this from an admission standpoint, I know what grades you have, I know what activities you've done, I know you're a major. There are likely things that I'm already molding over that you're probably going to talk about as it comes to your personal statements. Now, um, I've definitely read applications where I'm reading an application and I'm like, for sure this student wants to go into journalism. And this student, after reading everything, they say they want to become an open heart surgeon. And I'm like, I have no idea, based on your academics, based on your activities, how you ended up at that major. And because a lot of times the activities are a mishmash for what they want to do, I'm also a little confused about why they chose that in particular. So when we look at an application, we're really trying to be able to understand a student's entire story. What are their demographics? What courses did they take? What extracurricular activities? What were their test scores? If you say that you're interested in STEM, I'm expecting that you're gonna have an, a heightened accomplishment as it pertains to math and science. So those things are also gonna come out in the personal statement. When you write your personal statement, it should sort of line up and complete the entire picture and it should make sense. Um, that's sort of the biggest takeaway as we think about a contextualized review of an application. Um, Dr. Corgi sort of mentioned this at the beginning, and I just want to make sure that I mention it again. Um, it's really important to make sure that you don't just start writing because you have this idea of what you want to talk about without considering these other factors, because then you can have a great response, a great essay, but then it doesn't connect anything and it doesn't have true merit as it pertains to your college application, because I don't know how to contextualize that with the other information that I have. So it's really important that like, before you write anything, again, I'm gonna say it, they say if you said at least three times, people really get it. You wanna make sure that you have a thorough understanding of your academic profile. You wanna make sure that your activities and your resume are really sharing and telling the story that you wanted to share. You wanna include everything that you can on there because it's really important. And you wanna make sure that lines up with your major. So by the time that you get to your personal statements, you're able to seal this beautiful present with a nice bow and really present yourself to the best light that you can. All right, so we said stop, ready, go. So we as CPU, we work with students and navigating through this process. That's one of the advantages that you have in terms of working with people who know. Oftentimes I'm working with clients and they're not quite sure how to connect the dots. Well, you have someone like me who says, it's actually okay to report out that you're playing video games because you want to go into computer science. And we can talk about how that's relative to your overall application process. 
So we urge you all to reach out to us in terms of figuring out how CPU can help you in terms of navigating this. Now, I will tell you, we're actually almost booked on this call. We had another call earlier this week, which was almost booked. We're already starting our wait list for clients for this academic year coming up. So if you are going to need help or you think you may need help and just need some time to consult with us and sort of figure out how we can assist you, I urge you to reach out to us because we are really close to like starting our wait list right now. A little more about us here at CPU, we actually pride ourselves on making sure that we provide people with accurate and timely information so that they can make the best decisions in regards to their post-secondary options and career, and they can be in alignment. Um, one of the things that I have learned in my over a decade in this industry is that it really matters that you put your profile together in a way that makes sense to the best. If you go to a school and everyone at your school has a 4.4 and everyone's involved in a lot of clubs and activities, you're going to need people who can sort of help you make sure you stand out to the best way that you can. Um, something unique about our approach is that we offer one-on-one -on -one virtual assistance based on the packages that family offers. We have details about that on our website. And then a keynote that makes our program different than other programs is that as um, professionals in this industry, we are actually people who train other people to do this work. So I, myself, Dr. Corgi, George, we train people across the state and we've all presented at national conferences as it pertains to making sure that people have a thorough understanding of the college admission process. Um, at the end of this webinar, we are going to contact you um, and give you some of the resources that we talked about. And then George is going to wrap us up today with some strategies before we go into our Q&A. All right, awesome. Thank you, Dr. Okay. So I think it's absolutely necessary that we're able to be actionable during this time as we prepare and move forward. Um, so you want to go ahead and be very clear about your academic profile. Again, you want to complete your resume and activity worksheet, and you want to solidify and finalize choosing a major. So the way that we our approach is taken here at CPU is we like to do a personal review and multiple GPA calculations and we make recommendations for improvement. So it's absolutely vital that you understand what your academic profile says about you and what you could still do. For my juniors and younger on the call, this is absolutely vital because if you know your academic profile does not align with your dream colleges and your potential major, there's still time for you to go ahead and get this review in and we will make the best recommendations so that you can go ahead and be more competitive compared to your peers. Additionally, when we work together, we provide a template framework on how to write descriptions strategically. This is absolutely vital, okay? Like Dr. Corgi was mentioning and Dr. K, this is not the same as like your regular college English essay, excuse me, your AP English essay in high school. So you're taught you have a beginning, a middle, and an end. The beginning, right, the introduction sets everything up. The middle is a body, and the conclusion is just a repeat of what you just said. Unfortunately, when we're applying to our colleges, we are not given that much time. And so we want to ensure that we go ahead and we write things concisely and get straight to the point, especially when we have to talk about our activities. There's all sorts of very good strategies that we all know about that we'd be sharing with you, um, such as the best utilization of your character count. That's absolutely vital. Um, and then last but not least, which is a really good piece to the, the puzzle here is the career assessments. You wanna make sure that you're matching yourself to the correct college majors and you're strategizing long-term career plans. So when you think about this, it's vital for you to kind of consider what your ultimate goal is for going to college. A lot of times we think, okay, it's the pursuit of knowledge or other things. Ultimately, and parents always appreciate this when we say it is, it's for students to get a career, to solidify that they have a plan for their future. And when we work with our students, not only are we doing assessments about their personality, their majors, their careers, but we're having deep conversations about what this will look like anywhere from four to 10 years down the line, right? So that's why there's a big upswing in STEM and things of that nature. We are attuned to what these majors are, what the career outlooks will be, 
and how to best um, serve our students. So again, again, as always, we will be sharing our resources with all of our webinar participants. We're super excited um, to have a nearly full call here today. So we will be urging you to go ahead and join our um, CPU Facebook group. Uh, we'll give you some assessments for majors, the UC handout that will go over what um, sorts of activities you should be writing about, and the two links to uh, private school applications through the Common App and the Coalition App. So we're going to go ahead and dive straight into the Q&A. So if you all um, have any more questions, feel free to type them in. The first one we're going to take a look at is, how does double majoring factor in when applying to schools? I can go ahead and take that one. Um, that's a, a very common question. Um, a lot of students say they want to double major, which is awesome. But here's the thing, when you apply, you can only pick one, all right? You don't apply as a double major. So there is definitely strategy behind picking which of your two majors is going to work more in your favor for the admissions process. Um, I've seen some very interesting combinations. One of my favorites, which I've seen multiple times, is biology and some sort of um, theater arts or visual arts. Um, we have a lot of students who are into dance in high school. They're, they're artists or something like that, but their long-term goals is they're thinking like pre-med, you know, med school. So whatever your combination is, um, again, this is what we've been talking about today, is we need to look at your qualification set and see which major is going to be the best one to angle to get you into the college that you want to go to and then we can look at you know okay once you um decide which major you want to move forward with then we can look at the other at the other major and the process for adding a second major when you actually enroll at the college so you start with one with the idea of adding a second one um, once you're a freshman um, or a sophomore in college. Okay, awesome. So another really good question here is, how important is the essay in the admissions decision? So as we think about the essay, the essay is a, for schools who are asking for an essay, they're really asking for that as an opportunity for you to be able to give them something additional that your test scores and your activities don't tell you about, don't tell the reader about you as an applicant. So it is really important that you execute the essay really well within context of your overall application. Okay, awesome. Um, here's a good question and a very popular question, like we mentioned about being undeclared. Will my chances of getting admitted into a school change if I choose to be undeclared? I'll jump in on this one. Um, actually, no, there are very few colleges that require you to select a major. Um, pretty much every school has the option of going in as undeclared, but you want to go in with that strategy if it's appropriate for you. Um, a lot of families, um, you know, parents and students think, oh, well, I'm going to go in undeclared because it's probably quote unquote easier but really their intention is to be an engineering major or a computer science major. And if you don't start as a freshman in that major at some of these colleges, the likelihood of you kind of transferring in or declaring that major later is gonna be a lot harder than you think. So there is a lot of discussion um, that needs to go behind that decision to go and undeclared. But if it is right for you, if it's truly the best option, it will not hurt you at all. What it ends up hurting are students who use it as what they think is a backdoor or an easier way to get into a college. And that, that doesn't work out for them in the long run. Um, but if you really have no idea what you want to study, you can go undeclared. It's totally fine. It's not going to hurt your chances of being admitted. Awesome. Okay. Um, this one's a little similar to one we just answered, but it says, it seems that if a student is not sure of their major or career, yet are well-rounded, having taken elevated math classes with social science classes, can this be turned into an advantage? 
I'll go ahead and take that one. So it's definitely can be seen as an advantage if a student has a well-rounded profile and they're competitive all around. Um, sort of want to mirror what Dr. Corgi just said. It will depend on what school they're applying to. I, we can tell you very definitively that the most commonly selected major is undecided. So it may do the student more favor in order to do some investigating and exploring beforehand so that they can go in with a particular major versus doing undecided. Because if they're going to be applying to a school where students are admit, admitted based on major and they're applying for the most common major, that may not work in their favor. So like my biggest like takeaways for this particular student is one, you kind of want to have someone who can help you explore that process so that you're able to make the best decision because it may not serve that student to apply as undecided when they can apply as something else that would better serve their um, possibilities of getting in and they can get some clarity about what they may want to do before that point. Yeah, and I think one thing to take note that we mentioned in one of our last webinars was that if the student is not graduating this year, so that's juniors and earlier, this is a prime opportunity for students to explore um, some majors or some topics that maybe they didn't have a chance to do because a lot of things will remain virtual through summer and possibly even fall. So this would be a great opportunity for students who are undecided to at least expose themselves to new opportunities. Okay, another question that we have here is, what if I'm not the best at writing? What can I do? I'll jump in there. Um, that's okay. You don't have to have a, you know, award-winning essay on your college applications. In fact, there are, I would say, a less than 10 colleges that are truly looking for something out of the box and really heavy on the creative side when it comes to essay writing. So as long as you can communicate your thoughts um, in an organized and clear fashion, you're going to be just fine. All right. Um, it also is very obvious to the reader when the, the essay doesn't really match the rest of the application. You know, a lot of students feel a lot of pressure to, you know, really level up their vocabulary or they try to write things in it. And it's just that it sounds awkward when they when the admissions officer reads it and I really can't explain it. It's just something that admissions officers kind of get a sixth sense to. The, the student voice, we can tell when it's genuine and when it's not. So if you're not a great writer, that that's okay. Again, as long as your content is strong, your ideas are clear, your, your essays are gonna be totally fine. Um, there's a couple of exceptions. I'll just go ahead and throw it out there. Like if you're if you're one of your schools is University of Chicago, that school is definitely um, known for its extremely challenging essays. I've known students who have decided not to apply to University of Chicago because they didn't want to write the essays that are required for the application. But that's very, very rare. There's a very small number of schools that are like that. So again, what we would suggest you do is, you know, work with a counselor to figure out what you should be writing about. And then, you know, once you get that down and you get some rough drafts, then definitely take advantage of whatever you can to help you, um, you know, kind of spice it up a little bit. Um, but it's it really comes down to how just straightforward and clear you are with your content and a, gen a feeling of genuineness in that needs to come across in your writing. Okay, awesome. Let's see. So we have another one that just came in nice. With COVID-19, if a student has not done too many extracurriculars, what can they do? If students has a very consuming activity, like say Irish dancing, how do they justify the low amount of other extracurriculars? It's a really good question. So I think that that's actually really great. So what happens is, and I, I want to put this in context. So with the example of something like Irish dancing, which I'm assuming if they're spending a lot of hours, it's really competitive. That would be very similar if a student was doing like um, on a varsity team for football, basketball, baseball, or they were doing um, competitive um, band or something along those lines where they're spending a lot of hours doing that activity. That is fine. And it does like, take away from their ability to do other things 
but you still want to be able to sort of connect what their overall interest is in the future. So when I think of dancing, I immediately think if a student tells me they want to go into biology, um, we could talk about anatomy, we could talk about the human framing, we can talk about building stamina and all of those things that can be interconnected with someone who wants to go into biology. So making the connections is simple for someone like myself or Dr. Uh, Corgi or George, because we see connections that sometimes students don't see. Now, if a student doesn't have time for other activities because of that, then we also can help you come up with creative ways to still be involved. One of the advantages that we see via COVID-19, and we talked about this in a webinar a couple of weeks ago, but like students are able to get a lot of exposure and experience from a lot of different things online. So maybe if you're interested in a particular thing, you log on to a lecture that's being hosted at a school in New York um, because you have access to it because we're at home and we're online. Maybe you find some sort of virtual activity that simulates what you would be doing if you were actually taking part in that activity. So there are ways to stay connected and be engaged with whatever the interest is if you have an extracurricular that takes up a lot of your time where you can still make it work. So it's typically just a matter of going through the process of figuring out how to make that best work within the context of your profile. Awesome, that's great. Okay, we have another one here that says, what can I do this summer to strengthen my profile? That's a really great question. And <laughs> the answer is, well, we need to look at your profile first <laughs> to see, um, you know, yeah, what, what areas do need a little bit of a boost, whether it's in the area of academics or if it's in the area of extracurriculars or you know what, whatever it might be. Um, so that would definitely require um, more review. We would have a ton of questions to ask you before we could give you a really good answer. Um, but uh, the, the good thing is, is that you still have plenty of time whatever you, your you know deficiency or hole might be right now you know in the month of may of junior year you really have a solid you know three to five months uh, ahead of you to do something substantial um so as far as what that is yeah you definitely need to to speak with somebody and you know have them review everything for you and then point you in the right direction um, but you'd want to get started on that sooner rather than later. Um, just so you are aware, you know, when you're filling out your college applications, you know, you are putting on there everything that you have completed and everything that you plan to do um, through the completion of senior year. So you, you still have time, um, especially if you're getting on it now. This is really, we're almost right at the cusp, okay, of where we're about to cross over um, into, you know, oh man, if you had started this a month ago, you know, you'd be in much better shape. Um, but anyway, yeah, that's a really difficult question to answer generally because every person's going to have um, personalized uh, recommendations as far as what they should be doing this summer. Okay, great. So as we begin to kind of wind down, uh, the last question here is, I've looked at your packages online and don't know which would be best for my daughter. How do you help in deciding which package to choose? That's actually a very appropriate question. So the way that we help people decide the package, we have an intake process where we ask a lot of questions about your student, their activities, what they're doing, what their interest is in order to gauge the level of support that they're gonna need in order to reach their goals. So one of the things that um, we have the luxury of is we've been in the industry so we can sort of gauge like based on what you told me, this student probably needs this particular package in order to meet their need. So that's something that we do with our initial contact interview with a family in order to help them decide which package would be most appropriate. All right. And I think uh, George said that that is the last question. I want to thank you all for joining us. I'm so excited that we have another webinar that was literally maxed out. Um, so it's great to have so many people here. I'm looking forward for me and my team to work with you this year. Thank you for joining CPU, and I hope you have a great evening. Goodbye.